everyone for being here. Um, this isn't helpful. The bridge to benefits tool that we're going to talk about today, I have found to be pretty helpful in working with students um, and providing uh, just some more resources. So um, I'm going to borrow a concept from Tina England, who will be joining us um, from Second Harvest. She's a SNAP coordinator. Um, but she talked about it's like patching a quilt together, right? And so pe different people have different needs. And so we find pieces that help folks when we can. So like I said, we're gonna share, and then can you turn on captions too, please? That might help. If, sorry, just one second. Perfect. So we are recording these sessions as well. Um, please do feel free to ask your questions in the chat for our folks in person. Um, just shout them out. Um, this is relatively informal uh, as far as presentations go. So I wanna make sure that we're answering your questions. Um, Samuel, it's cool if you wanna like hold that so you can see it. I'm good with, with the stuff that's up here. I'm just gonna have you advance slides if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and if you want to go ahead and do an introduction, if you want to introduce yourself, and then we'll get started. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Samuel Guadarami. I'm the graduate assistant for the Maverick Diversity Institute. Awesome. Thank you so yes. much. So Sam has been a huge help in just getting uh, some of our promotional materials out um, and helping to coordinate the Zoom and the registration piece. So we are grateful to have him here. Um, the Maverick Diversity Institute, just a, a quick little plug. It's a series of programming. We have, I think, approximately 10 sessions this semester that are set um, ranging in topic from things like resources for students to microaggressions to critical race theory. Um, and so please do keep an eye on our website. We'll get some updated programming there. Um, and we will also, um, we have a Facebook page, which is, you know, vintage. Uh, but feel free to follow us on Facebook. We're, we're working on Instagram, but that's a spring 2022 goal. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, stay in touch with us. We are creating a badge that people can share on their LinkedIn page um, when you've attended four sessions. So we thought 10 offerings, it would be feasible to be able to get four in a semester. Um, and then recognizing too, that when we're talking about equity and diversity, these are topics that um, we are never fully realized in, right? We're never done learning about them. And so with the Diversity Institute, we have these badges, they'll be by semester. And so you wanna kind of collect them all, a la Pokemon uh, or something along those lines. So uh, make sure that you're doing that. So Bridge to Benefits and SNAP. Um, this is just a helpful tool that I found, I'm particularly working with students with children but we've also discovered that it's helping our work study eligible students as well as our grad assistants. Um, and primarily this particular resource best serves our domestic students uh, with documentation. And so we will, um, we can make referrals for international student support, for undocumented student support, but for our purposes today, this is primarily um, supportive of, of those populations. All right, so if you wanna click us to the next slide. Um, so I, my introduction or kind of the way that I want to lead off is that the last year and a half has thrown into, uh, you know, sharp relief for folks, the, the very precariousness, I think, of uh, wage work, especially, or gig work um, that our students are participating in. There is a myth, uh, I think, among both people within the institution and without the institution that if you can afford college, you should be able to afford all sorts of stuff, um, including housing and food. And we know that that just isn't true. Um, and so student loans and grants and scholarships and those items aren't necessarily flooding over um, and filling plates, paying rent, um, managing, car payments, et cetera. And so um, as we want to serve our students who are here for 
a great opportunity to learn. We want to make sure that those basic human needs are met, and this may be an avenue for some of that. So um, this particular tool, the Bridge to Benefits tool, is a 12-question assessment. And I'm going to talk a long time about those 12 little questions. Uh, it's a 12-question assessment that helps to determine um, like income-based benefits. So health insurance programs, energy assistance programs, supplemental nutrition assistance programs, which used to be it was formerly food stamps, women, infants, and children, which is another food program for people with kids uh, or people who are pregnant, school meal programs, child care assistance, early learning scholarships, and then earned income and working family tax credits. And so for some of our students, the bulk of this might be irrelevant to them. But if we can get somebody hooked up with some health insurance, if we can help somebody get a little extra grocery money to stretch the bill, I think that's a huge service to our students. Um, so if you want to click to the next. So what, oh, sorry, this does not do well on the screen. I'm hoping that for the viewers at home that it's a little better. Uh, <laughs> these colors are a bit much in person. So the tool does not apply to the program. This is simply a, is this gonna be worth your time to track down your W-2s, to get a copy of your lease agreement, to get your social security card from maybe your parents or a lock box you have it stored in. Um, but this is not the application process. This is just determining eligibility. This is not a guarantee. Some of these programs, some of these grants, like the energy assistance, as well as the child care assistance, is a, it's a pool of money, it's finite. And so once it's been applied through and all that money has been assigned for the year, then folks, then it doesn't exist anymore. And so just because someone might qualify for it on this end, doesn't mean that they'll receive it on the back end. And this does not ask for any personal information. So if a student is undocumented, if they um, are concerned that people are gonna find out, this, is, this tool is just like a BuzzFeed quiz. It doesn't ask who you are. It doesn't ask uh, any um, identifying details until the very end if a student is choosing to participate in the referral process, okay? Questions about that? So far, so good. Okay, so why, why do we want to do this? Um, this is this can ease those monthly expenses. Two hundred dollars. If I'm, I mean, I was in college a hot minute ago, but two hundred dollars is a lot of money. Like you can pay your phone bill. You can maybe make a car payment. You can definitely buy gas if you've got that money in your pocket instead of being like, do I buy groceries or do I buy gas this week? So it can ease those monthly expenses. It improves economic well-being for children of our students. Students with kids are a population we know very little about. Um, we don't collect that information. The only thing we know is like a number of students who do the FAFSA that say they have dependent children. That's it, that's all we know. And so um, actually another program that the Women's Center is doing in partnership with Counseling Center and um, the non-traditional student resource office is uh, we're doing an assessment. So we're gonna do a focus group. We've sent out a survey for students with kids to fill out. So if you know of students with children, let me know and I can get you all those materials. Um, but it brings federal dollars into Minnesota. So it's good for the local economy. Like if I have money, I can go to the grocery store here. I can go to the farmer's market here for my, using my SNAP card um, to buy groceries locally. And then it helps to break down stigma and lack of awareness about these programs. People have a lot of feelings about benefit programs. Um, and so we'll talk through some of that as we go as well. Next slide, please. And also, let me just say, my name is Liz steinborn Gorley. <laughs> the director of the Women's Center here. Um, I did not introduce myself earlier and I apologize for that, but uh, better late than never. So, when do we use the bridge to benefits tool? Um, we can wait until a student is talking with us about financial challenges they're facing. That certainly is like an easy, hey, I have this quick you know, 10 minute survey we can do to see if you might qualify for some benefits. Um, or, or additionally, 
We can invite all work study and tell eligible students to participate because odds are good that they're gonna qualify for something. We can invite all grad assistants. We can invite people with kids to apply or to participate. And we can even offer time during a class to allow students to screen themselves. So if somebody wants a room full of computers and we sit down and we have everybody do it themselves, I'm happy to facilitate that. So think about that as you're considering some programming and outreach that you do in your own areas. Um, but basically we don't have to wait until somebody's like caught up in their financial struggle before we let them know about this. And we'll be working on some publicity and marketing strategies that help to address, uh, you know, kind of demystify what SNAP is and what some of these benefits are. All right, next slide, please. Okay, an important piece, as you might use this tool with a student, we are not caseworkers for this. I don't work for SNAP. I don't have insight with the Minnesota Valley Action Council about how much money is left in the grant pool for utilities but we're referral agents. And this tool, this can, students can use this on their own without ever talking to us. You can go do it right now. It's like bridge to benefits.org uh, and fill it out. And um, this is just another way, especially if we're emergency grant um, advisors or if we work for financial aid or if we're having conversations often with students about some of the um, things going on outside the classroom for themselves, we can be those referral agents. Okay. All right, again, oof, these colors. The screen we've got here is a little rough. Um, students can use this tool. There's a couple ways. You can go to bridgetobenefits.org and you, can, you don't have to log in to start the assessment. You just go, fill out the 12 questions, keep it moving. The reason we want people to use the login feature or function is that it helps collect some data for us. Nothing identifiable. Students' names are not recorded. Well, I don't want to say that. Students' names might be recorded. The username might be recorded. But um, we don't, it doesn't give us like, here's the, the spreadsheet about their individual finances. It just gives us information. They qualified for this much SNAP. They qualified for this many grants. Because then we have a better idea of what it is our students actually need. And then we can look at piecing together some other um, benefits and opportunities. And so I've broken it really into three categories. And again, I'm not married to these categories. I'd rather just have the information. Um, and I will be sure Samuel will send this out to everybody who's participated in our um, event today so that you have all these logins. But if a student does it on their own, um, that's helpful to know. Um, if we're faculty or staff, um, and I didn't edit our name outside of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Then you do MNSU remote, and the password is B2B2. And then uh, for diversity, equity, and inclusion staff, then we use MNSU diversity with the password B2B3. Okay. This was just helpful. It just gives me a spreadsheet that I can send an, a list um, to administrators to help, to help better paint a picture of some of the things that our students are experiencing. Um, and so that's my only encouragement or like the reason for the logging in piece. All right, NIFT. Okay, so these are disclaimers that I try to make with students real like to the point and upfront. This is an assessment only. You still need to provide documentation when applying for these benefits. So again, this is like, this is the budget speed quiz. And if you actually want this stuff, you have to do the application. If you're not a US citizen, you may or may not qualify for some of these benefits. People with children, particularly people with American born children are more likely gonna be eligible even if they themselves are not citizens. Um, but we're happy to talk through that um, with each individual. This is all an estimate. Again, these benefits are based on a dollar amount, like a dollar amount of income. And so, Actual benefit amounts, because what I think of off the top of my head with a student, like how much is, do I make a month pre-tax? Okay, that's a guess. Once you get into the actual number with the application process, those, those dollar amounts might change. Um, and then I read every question, even if I think I already know the answer. For example, one question is, 
what's your status? Single, married and living with your partner, married and living apart from your partner or something like that. Well, I thought that I knew this student that I was doing this for, but I read the question and found out the student was married and I was blown. I was like, I, that was not, I didn't have any context for that. So uh, don't assume you know the answers about the students um, that we're serving. So make sure that um, we're just asking each question as it comes up. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so again, if we have students who are undocumented or who are international students, we don't necessarily need to turn them away. But at the same time, I'm also being really upfront to say most of these benefits would come into play if you have kids, healthcare, um, food, um, if they're pregnant. Um, and so there is a number that the Bridge to Benefits website, which also has an enormous um, Q&A section. So you can look up commonly asked questions if you have your own questions, but they have a number for mid-Minnesota legal aid. And so I definitely encourage, there was a hang up when we first started this. There was um, something called being a public charge, which means that you, if you utilize public benefits, from the federal government and you're not, you don't currently hold citizenship and then later you would apply for citizenship, you wouldn't get it. It'd, it'd be pretty much, you wouldn't get it because you use taxpayer money and you're not, it sucked. And it was bad and it's not a problem anymore. But I definitely regardless think that, um, especially uh, for undocumented folks or people who are not sure what they're, um, what their status might mean and who's getting their information, they can contact them in Minnesota Legal Aid, okay? So, um, yeah, the next one, Samuel, thanks. Okay, so we're gonna go to the website and Samuel, do you wanna drive on this one? Is that gonna work for us? <laughs> go to the website. Yes, and for our viewers at home <laughs> or in your office, you're certainly welcome to play along with us. You can, um, hi Tina, good to see you. Uh, we'll certainly uh, let you work through it um, on your own if you wanna follow along. But we're just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my spiel uh, as though you were a student coming in seeking the opportunity to go through this. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Tina England who we're so excited to have. That's what we're gonna do. <laughs> I am not, no, I'm not just bringing this for all those tight corners. That's amazing. Ooh, captioning this up apparently. That's pretty, pretty powerful, Zoom. All right, so this is what the Bridge to Benefits page looks like. So bridgetobenefits.org, that green start button, don't click it. The green start button, though, is the screening tool that just any, anybody can do. Um, we're going to go over to the left-hand column where it says partner login. And remember those passwords we had. So MNSU diversity, we'll put that one in. And then our password was lowercase b to b3. All right. And then we'll log in and hopefully it works. All right, okay. And so here at the bottom, you can see a little bit of information about some of the screening tool. Um, you can select that you're just playing with it. So I encourage you to get in there and like put in some numbers and see what happens. Um, but you wanna indicate to them that that's what you're doing. So we're gonna click on the left side. It's a screening tool and that's the one we want. Okay, so this is it. This is where we start. So this is another one where I like to read everything because it does impact the result. And this is for people living in the, in the environment together. So when it asks if someone in the family has a physical or developmental disability, that would be if they're living with you and would be considered for benefits under you as the individual. Um, grandparents under, and then everybody, all of our students are currently a student at a Minnesota college or university. So if you wanna select that Samuel, that last one, for our purposes, we're gonna do that one and keep going down and click next. 
This is if too, if the student doesn't necessarily live with the parent or if they're living with the parent and paying rent, there can be some fine details. But again, these are the programs that um, we'll talk about that, that the screening tool covers. The nice thing I wanna point out is that in bold, they say this tool should be used whenever your circumstances change. So you change jobs, you have a kid, you move, you, there's just, it's good to kind of keep up with it. So we're gonna to scroll to the bottom. And I've covered all of this stuff and you can hit next. All right, so who are you helping? We are gonna say that we are just playing with the screening tool for now. I select a client, customer, or family that I work with when I do this with a student. Uh, which county? Let's do Bluer. And describe your living situation. We're gonna keep with single and click next. Do you plan to file taxes? We'll say yes. Are you or your spouse or partner pregnant? We'll say no. Do you have any children? We'll say no. And we'll click next. This is, I just wanna give you, we're just kind of glancing through this. Obviously you can go through and, and look at it in more depth. So under the amount of money before taxes and deductions you make from work monthly or yearly is the drop down option. So for our purposes, we're gonna say $800 a month And these are arbitrary numbers, right? Because we're playing. Um, if they get any unemployment, et cetera, we're gonna say zero. I'm just basing this on what the bulk of the answers have been uh, when I meet with students to go over this. And social security, we're gonna say zero as well. But this, if there's veterans benefits, uh, if someone's receiving disability, if they're in a cash, program. Um, there are some cash programs through the county that folks might be eligible for. We want to make sure that we're indicating that. But generally, they're already going to know about these resources if they're involved in some of that stuff. So um, we'll say no to the unemployment insurance. And then for this one, um, I have students put in their, their book expenses and if they're paying anything out of pocket. So we'll put $500 down here. And this is for healthcare really is where that, um, they'll put it for yearly for the 500. Thanks. So that one just kind of an estimate, okay? And then hit next. So this would be people they share meals and expenses with. So this is like, I have a roommate and we share all of our bills. Okay, so then you could look at that. If, everybody's kind of out for themselves, then it, they would say zero. So we're gonna say zero just for our purposes. But some folks you know, are splitting costs a lot more and you wanna indicate that. Like one student told me they had like five roommates and then they were eligible for a whole bunch of SNAP money because there were a lot of people who could eat under that <laughs> umbrella. So for in, enter the income here, we'll say zero. <clears throat> and We'll say no dependents, but if they have children, this is who they would. No, just kidding. These would be other dependents outside of who do not live with them. Um, and then enter the income for all the people you counted in the question above, and we'll say zero there as well. And then results. So that's it. You used to ask how much paid on rent, but with COVID, they changed that which is kind of nice. So here we can see that these would be the programs that someone uh, might be eligible for based on those numbers that we shared. And so medical assistance, healthcare coverage. Um, again, this is where you can ask the question, are you, do you need healthcare coverage? Do you have healthcare coverage? If somebody's with their parents' insurance, maybe that's good. Maybe for some of our students who've, um, who are no longer receiving support for a variety of reasons or have been kind of cut off from family, um, this would be really good to know um, so that we can help get them enrolled in that. If they choose, and I'll put a pin in what I was gonna say. So SNAP eligible for up to $234 a month. Um, energy assistance, this is that annual grant. And again, that's a finite pool of money, whereas the SNAP is federally funded and 
as far as I know. Well, Tina will tell us. Uh, and then our earned income and working family tax credit. And I let folks know if they do VITA or if they do h and Block or if they do TurboTax, that a lot of times these, these tax credits just kind of manifest as you're filling out your information. But it's good to have in mind that you should be looking for those things. Um, and there's information. So then you say you want to apply. You're in, we're interested in everything. And so then here, um, we just say, I leave it all as one-on-one -on -one for the application process. Some programs like the healthcare program is gonna come with instructions on how to apply online. Um, the energy assistance also, there's some instructions on what you need to do there. Um, but we'll say, we'll say get our personalized application plan. You're doing great, Samuel. Thank you. All right, so now this is where they can make a choice to input their information or not and be like, cool, I'm glad we played along with this little quiz, but I'm done, see ya. Um, and that's completely fine. But here we can see, um, this is where we put in their first and last name, their address, a phone number that they um, wanna be reached at and if they want texts or calls, their email address, best time, time to contact, preferred language. And then in the notes section, if you can just put your name and that you work at MNSU, that's helpful for any of the folks in these, uh, any of our referral recipients, if they have follow-up questions, and then they're knowing where the referral is coming from. Are people driven, how are people getting driven to the website? So we'd fill all this in, and then we would select um, if they were interested in information about healthcare, energy assistance, or supplemental nutrition assistance, We'd select all three and hit send, and that would send out to those three organizations to let them know that this person is interested in applying and someone would reach out with that process, okay? We can click skip and get the same result or the same information would be on the next screen, um, even if they did send in their information. Yep. So then it, this is like 10 pages long, but I think it's really helpful. It talks about where the application is for medical assistance. So Open Door does all of that. Um, Second Harvest does that. Um, be mindful too, if we're serving students who are living outside of this particular area, they're gonna get different results. And there are some different benefits in different counties. And so that county piece is really important where they're residing. Um, and so we'll just keep scrolling. So this gives contact information up front on that dollar amount. Um, and then we'll just keep on going. And then it gets into the details. So this is where it talks about what the application process is like, what information is needed. Um, and so I don't, I actually kind of purposefully don't really dive into this with students because again, it's that personal choice of whether or not they're gonna apply. But I do wanna make sure that I'm following up with them like a week later to say, hey, we talked about this. Have you heard anything? Do you want more information? Um, as a way to make sure that people know we're still um, in their corner, we still care about them. We still wanna get them resources that are helpful. So here, like, all the verifying documentation that you might need. Just having that in mind, like, okay, I gotta get some paperwork in order. You can start doing that before the person from the representative calls to um, have the conversation about the application process. So questions, this is, this is the assessment. Do people have questions about this? How about our chat? We've seen anybody with questions online? Thanks to our viewers. All right, well then we'll go back to our PowerPoint because I've got one more little slide I wanted to touch on and then we're gonna turn it over to Ms. Tina. Um, Quick recap. All right. 
Okay, so this is the helpful links. Um, so COVID-19, that information is always changing, right? We know new information is always coming out. Programs are like supported and then they aren't, and then they are, and then they aren't. Uh, <laughs> and frequently asked questions. And I, I have to say, they've done a really phenomenal job with this site. I'm just keeping things going and keeping it updated. Um, they send updates to me. Um, if major things change, like when that public charge stuff was happening, they were like, this is like warn people. And then they're like, okay, don't, don't worry about it anymore. Um, and so that was really helpful. Um, the frequently asked questions sit in there for a little bit. I think if you're really going to start using this tool with students, sit in it a little bit and, and read up so that you have some answers already. Um, it again is very thorough and has been really helpful. Um, I have felt when I've used this tool with other folks. Food resources. So as we're talking, um, you know, if we're coming to the realization that the student we've been talking with may, may not be eligible, but is still like, they make too much, but they don't have enough. The food resources that we have locally are really incredible. And I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage students to utilize them. The Maverick Food Pantry uh, is right here in Karkowski 142, right? 142. Um, if people walk straight in Preska, hit a brick wall and take a left, they're right there. There's great, um, there's great food, um, nutritional food. There's, you know, meat and produce and dairy and canned goods and pantry items. And then household goods like toilet paper and laundry detergent and dish soap and shampoo. And so there's really, um, it's really an awesome thing. Um, the students order online. So you put in your star and password and then you get your profile and you just order whatever groceries you need and then pick it up Mondays, Wednesdays, or Fridays from the food pantry. Campus Cupboard runs on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which is amazing. So then five days a week, we have food access right near camp, the heart of campus. And Campus Cupboard is located in Crossroads Community Church, just across or just behind the Performing Arts Building. Um, and they have similarly, there's grocery items. I think on Tuesdays, they have dollar hot lunch um, where students can go pay a dollar, get a free lunch or get a dollar lunch. Uh, and that, that disappeared during COVID, but has come back, which I think is great. Um, and there's also the campus kitchen. So uh, if the food pantry is closed or if the cupboard is closed, students can grab like a sandwich or a cup of soup or, or a meal. There's access to meals whenever the doors to the church are open, really, um, which is convenient right here by campus. Echo Food Shelf um, also does not, it doesn't have a um, citizenship requirement or a uh, anything like that, but it is, they do need proof of where you live um, because they're serving Blue Earth and Nicollet um, counties. And so students can access that. I think it's 10, it's like 10 or 12 visits in a year. Um, and you can go up at least once a week. Um, and so if that can help get someone through a hard semester, then they still have access to those resources even later on. Of course, the emergency grant, which um, gives students, again, those Pell eligible students the opportunity to get some funds if that un like unexpected thing, the car accident, uh, or the car repair, the broken computer, the, you know, whatever the case, the medical bill. Um, and then our non-traditional student services website is this, like, it's, it's basically a phone book um, and a directory for a ton of local programs, apartment complexes, um, more food access related things, childcare related things. It's really, um, really pretty exhaustive, I feel. So those are some helpful links. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna pause and, and again, ask if there's any questions from the crowd. Yeah. Yes, uh, what website are students able to sign up for the Maverick Pantry? Yeah, so that is honestly, if you go MSU Maverick Food Pantry, yeah. it'll pop right up in your search bar, but it's this website and I will send, so if you've signed in, make sure you sign in before you leave. Then we'll email everybody out the PowerPoints that um, Tina and I shared today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so I do want to make sure we have plenty of time. Uh, Tina England um, has delightfully agreed to be here with us today. 
uh, virtually to talk about SNAP. She has been um, a fantastic partner with the MNSU community. She's um, partnered with us. She's come to campus pre-COVID to meet with students, to get them enrolled in benefits. Now with COVID is doing that virtually, um, but we're super grateful to have you and thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over here to you. Samuel's got your PowerPoint and he'll get that pulled up here in just a second. Great, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I'm, I'm always excited to come to MSU and do things. I'm, a, I'm an alum from there, Women's Studies and English Literature from in the late 90s. So always happy to be here on, on with folks. Um, go ahead and uh, skip forward, Samuel. SNAP is one of many community services that's available to our communities, our neighbors, and your students. And Liz has done a fantastic job of going over a lot of what is available. Go ahead and skip forward. <coughs> Excuse me. These are just some of the resources. Liz touched on a couple of these, the food shelves, campus cupboard, um, campus kitchen. United Way 211 was referenced in some of the Bridge to Benefits information and you don't have to go through Bridge to Benefits to access that, that's available all the time. Um, but these, these are all local community or regional um, resources that are available to folks living in the, in the area. Down here, we have SMERLs, Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services. They are a partner with Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid, so you can call either one of them if you have questions about immigration and public access. If you have questions or your students have questions about housing, they get an eviction notice, they're not sure it's legal, those sorts of things. Um, Go ahead and go forward. As you saw there, we are one of the referring agencies that will receive referrals. It is regional based and we get um, five counties around Mankato, Blue Earth, Brown, Lassoy, Nicollet, and Montlawn County. There are 32 state grantees who do SNAP outreach and they are the other people who would get this. So if you have a student calling who's, um, who's in Morrison County or Martin County, and they fill this out, they'll go, Bridge to Benefits will refer them to a different agency, but that's fine. We all do the same thing. Um, I've even trained some of the folks at some of the other agencies. So um, they're still gonna receive great service and assistance. Go ahead and skip forward. Alrighty, I'm gonna talk about SNAP and what it is. Um, we all know that food insecurity doesn't happen in a vacuum. Let me say that first. Um, so usually if a student is experiencing food insecurity, there's also some question about housing, transportation, health care, um, health condition, access to services. So it's, it's real important to, to refer to all of these different things or keep them in mind. So remember that. Um, SNAP is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's a program of the USDA which in rural Minnesota sometimes makes it a little bit more acceptable to, to tap into USDA funds. It's a little bit less stigmatized. Um, it's sometimes called EBT, which is the actual card and they're pictured here. Um, it's been called food support, food assistance or food stamps. Um, the card on the, uh, let me see, left with the kind of drawn pictures is the older card. The card on the right with like the photo is the newer card, but these cards never expire. So if you're talking to a non-traditional student and they were on SNAP 20 years ago, if they still have that card, they can still reactivate it. Go ahead and forward. Great. So SNAP helps low-income Minnesotans get the food they need. Um, you can go to a food shelf. Um, actually, you can go all to all three of the food shelves that were listed, the Maverick Food Pantry, Campus Cupboard and Echo, get all the free food you can, right? Maximize those resources. But what if they don't have milk or butter or eggs? What if all they had was pork and you want chicken or beef? That's where your SNAP dollars can come in and you can supplement to make really nutritious, healthy meals with those things that students can get for free as well. Um, one thing about SNAP is that it is not the entire food budget. And I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, 
SNAP provides the ultimate client choice. Uh, food shelves are getting better and better about letting people select the items that they want to take from, from what's available, but some still are very much here, here's a box of food, have a nice day. Um, and there's, there's food waste involved with that then. With SNAP, there's a lot less food waste because folks can purchase what they will eat when they need it at the store of their choice. Um, and then the EBT card transaction helps maintain privacy. And SNAP stimulates the local economy. Another thing that's super important here in greater Minnesota or in food deserts, um, every dollar spent in SNAP money equates $1.70 in community spending, which is super helpful in some of our smaller towns. Go ahead and skip forward. Wonderful. So these are national average stats. Um, in 2019, the average monthly benefit for folks was $121 per person. In Minnesota, it would actually came out to about $111 for the monthly average. And then the minimum monthly award in 2019 and um, start of 2020 was $15. So based on your income and then some of your expenses, they determine how much of a benefit you will receive. Starting October 1 of 2021, there've been a couple of things in play. The big one has been a review of the Thrifty Food Plan. And that is, um, I have a little bit more detail, I think on the next slide about that, but that's one of the formulas that they use to determine how much is given to folks, how much of a benefit will be awarded. Um, with the Thrifty Food Plan revision, folks nationally are gonna get up to $169 per person. Um, again, average. That equals a 25% increase when paired with the annual COLA, which always is a couple of bucks increase. Um, so starting October 1, the monthly minimum goes up to $20 a month. Go ahead and skip forward. Perfect. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this slide because there's a lot of wording on here. Um, but basically, starting with the black grocery card on the left, in 2019, pre-pandemic, folks were receiving about $121 per person. Pandemic hit and different pandemic programming and waivers came into play, and everybody got bumped up to the maximum benefit allowed with a program called eSNAP. That's $240 a month, so significantly more. Um, if you were getting the minimum of 15, that e, uh, the eSNAP bumped you up to 240, which again, huge jump, hugely helpful. Going post pandemic, when the state of emergency ends, folks would receive an average of $169 a month with the Thrifty Food Plan revision. If that hadn't been passed, they'd only be receiving 133. So significant improvement there as well. This is the first revision to the Thrifty Food Plan since it was created in 1975. Um, and the real, real big win actually is that it'll be reviewed every five years without an act of Congress. So every five years, this will be reviewed for accuracy um, and, and cost of living and inflation and all of that. Go ahead and go forward. One more. We hear a lot, a lot, a lot about stigma and public shaming and guilting, but then there's even myths out there. Um, so I just wanted to touch on a couple of these. One is people don't think they're eligible because they make, they make money, right? They have a job, I'm working, I won't be eligible. The income guidelines do vary state by state. Uh, Minnesota looks at 165% of the federal poverty guideline, and I'll show you a graph of what that is or a grid of what that is here shortly, but it's a very liberal amount, actually. Um, folks don't think they qualify because they own a car or a home or they have a 401k or a savings account. In Minnesota, assets don't count against you. So you can have a 401k with money in it. You can have a car and a home. And if your monthly income is below the income threshold, then you should apply for the program you potentially qualify. I think that's really, really important because you shouldn't have to be completely destitute before you can get help. That doesn't set you up to succeed later. 
So this is a tool that we have here in Minnesota where you can maintain some of those assets to help you come out ahead when you're through whatever, whatever bump in the road you're experiencing right now. Um, the public charge thing, my family or my citizenship will be threatened. It is super, super important to, to know that that did not get implemented. It was enough just talking about it in the Trump administration to get a lot of people afraid and turn away from public assistance. And we're still trying to reach those families that would qualify for help that were, um, that were, were just put off because of this, this potentiality. So if you hear that from somebody, um, in fact, right now, public charge is not going to get in the way of their potential for citizenship. Go ahead and skip forward, Samuel. Okay. There are specific rules about college students applying for SNAP. Um, when they rewrote the Farm Bill the last time, they threw in some of these rules. One of them was that if you're attending school more than part-time, you must be working at least 20 hours a week. With COVID, that has been waived. So as long as we are in a public state of emergency at the federal level, that work requirement is currently waived. Students do have to be a citizen, and Liz touched on that very thoroughly. Thank you for that. Um, and there's a temporary waiver where if your EFC or your expected family contribution on the FAFSA is zero, students should really consider applying. That will go away after the public health emergency ends. However, if they qualify during the public health emergency, they'll continue qualifying until their review, which is every six months. So if, if your students have an EFC of zero, then they should be reaching out and applying for the program as long as they're below the income guideline. Um, one change that the state of Minnesota made permanent is around work study. Previously, work study, um, an, a work study award and payment of income from working that position was an exemption from that work requirement. The state of Minnesota has tweaked that a little bit here, which is fantastic. Now just having the award is enough to exempt you from that work requirement. So that's, that's kind of a fine distinction, but with the population that you guys are working with every day, um, it's an important one. So if a student has a work study award, um, they're exempted from that work requirement and should definitely consider applying. And then there's other exemptions for parents or caregivers disabled folks, um, students who are under 18 or over 50. Um, there's also some, some different exemptions and things in there. When in doubt, you can always call or text me and get some, some answers as well. Um, go ahead and go forward, Samuel. I'll have to pay back the benefits. No, SNAP does not function that way unless there's fraud, something illegal happened, um, or there's a mathematical error, which does happen. If the county makes a mathematical error and you get benefits and you're not supposed to, then that does have to be paid back. But just because you're using it doesn't mean you have to pay it back later. Um, everyone will know about it. There are rules in place to protect your privacy and your students' privacy. I have a little story here. I was helping a lady in Brown County in New Elm, excuse me, <coughs> sorry. Um, and and she was, she's a senior, and she didn't want to apply to the program, even though her monthly income was around $900, because her daughter-in-law opened all the mail at the county office, and she didn't want her daughter-in-law to know that she was feeling food insecure and looking for resources. So I was able to help her apply because I helped with the application process, and I directly sent it to the supervisor of the office, bypassing the front desk and then made sure she was aware of the situation. And she was able to put everything in the computer with a security key on it so that the daughter-in-law couldn't access any of that information. Couldn't even see that her mother-in-law was in the system. So in rural Minnesota um, and Blue Earth County, even though, even though Mankato's big, um, it's still rural. Um, if you have somebody who's a native from the area um, or has been around for a long time, that could be a concern. And so there's ways around, um, around that to keep privacy. Um, it's a big hassle or it's too hard. No doubt, it's a nine page form, um, seriously. And so 
in addition to filling out a government form, which can be intimidating, it's nine pages long. That's what SNAP grantees are here to do. We fill out this form with folks. We take all the information over the phone. Right now, there's a waiver for signatures. So we can send it right straight to the county. Um, they can get that interview done, which is all part of this process, right? They can pick up a blank one from the county, fill it out themselves and turn it back into the county. Um, but we actually help fill that out if that's, if that's a concern for folks. Go ahead and skip forward. Alrighty, lots and lots of people qualify for this program and just don't realize it. Um, right now, about 81% of potentially eligible Minnesotans are actually utilizing the program. And in greater Minnesota, that's significantly lower. Um, I didn't have a chance to pull together new numbers, okay? But when I started in 2014, the SNAP utilization rate in Blue Earth County was around 32%. And in 2018, it was up to like 36%, still lots of room for growth. Um, COVID helped actually get the word out. Some of the waivers actually increased people's use of the program. Um, so it's, I'm, I don't doubt that it's higher now, but I'm sure it's still underutilized. Go ahead and go forward, Samuel. Great. Um, Liz did a great job with citizenship. Um, one key thing that I did want to mention, if you're working with students who are enrolled in DACA, as part of that enrollment um, to protect their ability to stay here, they have agreed not to access programs like SNAP. And so any students enrolled in DACA are not eligible for SNAP. They can use all the other stuff. They can go to the food shelves, produce distributions, food for all, fair for all, all of those things, um, but not SNAP. Um, so you can go ahead and go forward because Liz did a great job there. Liz also talked about determining household and it's important to know that every government program does this a little differently. And so um, for SNAP, if you are living together, buying and sharing food together, then you're a household for medical or energy assistance. Anybody living in the home is part of that household. So don't be surprised. If one student qualifies for one thing, but not another, because the rules are all a little different. <clears throat> How am I doing on time, Liz? Uh, we've got about six-ish minutes. Okay, go ahead and skip forward. Here's the income guidelines. Um, so they change every October, and I want to talk a little bit about this. As you can see, it's 165% of, of the federal poverty guideline. Um, it's fairly liberal, it's, it's fairly reasonable um, and, and opens it up to a lot of different folks. So you've got this as a tool to just kind of help know where, where that benchmark is at, right? Um, the green column is the maximum benefit amounts. And so in the Bridge to Benefits tool, it provides an estimated amount. As long as we're in that state of emergency and eSNAP is approved, which is done on a month to month basis, students would be receiving the maximum amount. So a student would be receiving up to $250 starting October 1 for their SNAP benefit going forward. Again, that ends when the state of emergency ends and it's awarded a month after the fact. So we know that the September benefit for eSNAP has been approved. A student who qualifies for SNAP in September would then receive whatever the difference is between the regular award and that maximum amount. And they would receive that bump up in October. So it's, it's kind of funky how it's paid out, but it does give them that maximum amount. Go ahead and skip forward. Don't need that. Go ahead. Um, there's a team of 12 of us here at Second Harvest um, and, and other grantees. We're the biggest team in the state of Minnesota, but other grantees, like I said, have, have very well-trained folks. And, and I've even trained um, Lutheran Social Services, MVAC folks, um, folks at the, um, what is it? Office of American Indian Affairs. I mean, we, we've trained a lot of different people throughout the state. Go ahead and go forward. If folks want to reach out to us directly, there is our contact information. And I think the next one is just my contact information. Go ahead. Yep. Alrighty. So 
any questions and Liz, I'll hand it back to you and I'll hang out and answer questions. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we'll send out these, these um, both of these PowerPoints so you can take a look at the um, information in more depth. But what are the questions? Do you have questions in the chat? Do you have questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you said that um, students who qualify for work study are able to, to go ahead and apply for this now, correct? Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Tina? Correct. As long as your income is below the income guideline, um, you should qualify. Okay, and then you said at the current moment, students at ESC is zero are at this moment able to apply for uh, SNAP. Correct, again, as long as they're below that income guideline, and that doesn't have to be a decision or a determination that you you all make. Um, we share that so that it's it's a good talking point. And you don't have to have the EFC as zero okay. necessarily just to apply. That's just good, like, it's looking real good for you if you do have zero, but you can still apply even if there is an EFC that's higher. Again, because it's like that household piece. So if mom and dad live in, you know, Colorado, and you're here, that, that can be different. Gotcha. And that's a good call out. If, if you're still a dependent of your parents, but they're in Colorado, you're here, and that's what SNAP cares about. So they're not part of your household if you are living here. Um, another thing is if you're in the dorms and you're on one of the lowest two tiers of meal plans, two or three, you can still apply for SNAP if you meet the other criteria. The thing is, if the meal plan provides more than 50% of your food, then it disqualifies you. But if it's providing less than that, then you may be eligible. Gosh, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. That gives me another like pathway of promoting at the dining center and stuff like that. So thank you. That's exactly. That's really yeah. Yeah. Any questions in the chat from our for office and home viewers? Good to see all of you. Crickets. Okay. That's because we're so thorough and we covered it all so well. <laughs> so um, to all of you, thank you so much. Thank you for being invested uh, in what's going on with our students outside of the, the campus, um, what's going on outside of the classroom. That's so, so important. Obviously, we know if you're hungry, learning is far from uh, as successful as it could be. And so please connect your students if you even have an inkling. and. That's a big part of kind of dismantling the hesitation or the bias that people feel about um, these social programs is just mentioning it and keeping it casual. And we're gonna start papering the campus in a variety of ways with just like, what is SNAP with, you know, I've got some, we're gonna go with Marvel references. We're gonna go with, but just to try to normalize some of the language around it, because why would you turn down grocery money when, it's there and you're eligible. So. Well, Tina, to you, thank you for the good work that you and your team does. Um, we're so grateful. We've got a comment. This was great. Thank you. We, we do appreciate your time. And um, you and I will be in touch about some other opportunities for linking our students up with that application process. Um, but again, I'm appreciative to you and the work you do. I'm appreciative to the work of our, our campus community. And please uh, email if you have any questions. Thank you for, for inviting us and for talking about it. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a good day.